Hi everyone, we're here again today at Conneaut Lake Vet Hospital and we're going to be doing another program for you for my dog and me. But rather than take the chance that I'm going to mispronounce something that we're going to be talking about today, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Consla and he's going to lead us into this and then I get to ask all the questions. <laughs> so uh, today we're going to be talking about hip dysplasia in dogs and cranial cruciate ligament tears uh, in dogs as well. Um, and we're going to start off with the hip dysplasia first. Okay. okay? Mm -hmm. So um, hip dysplasia is a congenital problem, meaning that it's um, hereditary. Um, the, the parents pass it on to the puppy. Um, there are certain breeds that are more predisposed to it. Um, your German Shepherds, um, Goldens, Bernese Mountain Dogs, things like that. Um, and then it manifests itself as hip problems um, as the animal matures. Well, got to stop you. Now you say that it's passed on. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you a question about that now? Mm -hmm. If it's passed on, if the mother or father have it, then the puppy is definitely going to have it? Not necessarily. Okay, that's um, what I was So about. when you get into genetics, you can kind of figure out or, or estimate, you know, if if this is like a dominant gene or a recessive gene, you know, what are the chances that the puppies are going to have it? So, if, you know, you have to know that the, the parents have it, and in that case, they shouldn't be used for breeding anyway. Absolutely. Because if they have, first of all, this can be a, a serious issue mm -hmm. that results in a lot of trouble for uh, the puppy down the road. But if they have this congenital problem, what else do they have that could be even more life-threatening? Okay, okay, good. Got you on that. All right. Yeah. Um, so, uh, we can talk about uh, the normal um, hip anatomy next, I think. And mm -hmm. so the, the hip is a, a ball and socket joint, meaning there is the thigh bone, which has a ball on it, and then the hip bone, which has a socket, and they come together like that um, to move around and, and do things that the hip Just like does. they do on us. Right, exactly. Okay. Um, the, the important factor with hip dysplasia is that the socket is deep enough to cover the majority of the ball and that the ball portion is nice and round. Okay. Okay. And that they're seated well together. There's no gaps or anything. And that's what it like should that. be. That's what it should be. Okay. okay. Is it, are they born like that? Yeah. Okay. They should be born and should have a tight hips from the beginning. Right. Now, when they're we hope. when they're young, you know the the growth plates aren't closed and stuff. So if you see like a puppy X-ray, they always look you know really weird. But mm -hmm. um, you know all those normal things should be there. And then as they mature and all the bones start to ossify, um, there shouldn't be any you know gaps or okay. or, or flattening or, or anything like that. Um, so clinical signs that people often notice. Um, there can be just intermittent uh, hip pain, uh, like this dog that we're, we're gonna look at these x-rays of. Um, some dogs will do a characteristic like bunny hop or kangaroo hop uh, hmm. type of thing, um, where they kind of move both hips at the same time when they're running. Um, lameness uh, in the back leg, it can be just one side, both, it can alternate between sides. Um, those are probably the most common types of things. On physical exam, when the dog's up here on the table and we're checking things out, we might notice that the range of motion of the hip isn't normal, so I can't extend it or flex it as far as I normally would be able to. Is that um, done when the dog is standing, mm -hmm. basically? Yeah, you pull the leg back. Um, don't they have... Don't they um, put up some resistance to that to some extent? Not generally, okay. not, not unless there's pain there or, okay. or, or something's right. not working. Um, there's some other maneuvers that you can do. Sometimes you can actually feel like laxity, like the joint isn't tight and so you can feel it kind of moving around. Um, some dogs might present with uh, a luxation or the hip is out of place or partially mm -hmm. out of place. Um, and, or just pain on palpation of, of the hips. Mm -hmm. Uh, some dogs that maybe have a more mild case of it when they're young um, or it's just never detected uh, might present later in life for arthritis issues in the hip. Um, just like any other joint problem, if there's ever mobility or laxity within the joint, we know that that joint is predisposed to arthritis. 
um, because things aren't nice and, right. and tight. They're kind of flopping around in there and, and that stimulates bone production and inflammation and we get arthritis. So as the owner, I would see the, <clears throat> the uh, what'd you say, can a kangaroo, is that what you said? A kangaroo bunny, yeah. Something like that, and then or, I would or see lameness, some you know, lameness, a limp, pain. Um, okay. you know, crying out, looking back at the hip, things of that nature. Okay, so mm -hmm. what's my next step? I can so, find you. Yeah, so yeah, you come and find me, um, or if we pick up something on exam, the, the next test is uh, an x-ray, okay. basically, to look at the hips and see what all those structures look like. Um, so I've got an x-ray here for us. This dog, um, it has more mild hip dysplasia in the grand scheme of things, and we'll look at some that are more severe as well. How old's this dog? This dog is about five years old. Okay. Um, and uh, the changes here are more mild, so we can appreciate some of the normals a little bit better uh, as well. So let me zoom in here. So this is the hip joint right here. Right here and right over there, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, we've got the thigh bone here or the femur. And then this is the pelvis here coming around, okay? The specific portion of the pelvis that we're looking at is what's called the acetabulum or this is our socket. And that's this C shape right here, okay? So can you see the ball of the femur mm -hmm. right there? goes into the socket. And that's what we want to see. But now, remember this dog has mild hip dysplasia, so there's some more subtle changes, okay? So if you look at the head of this femur, can you see how it's not perfectly round over here? Correct. It's actually a little flattened. So that's an abnormality. And then the other thing is, if we draw an imaginary line from one point of the acetabulum to the other. So this point to this point. If we make a line there, okay? Can you appreciate that only about half of that ball is covered mm -hmm. uh, by the socket? That's an abnormality. We wanna see around like 75% coverage of that ball to socket ratio. Why does this leg look like it's so far out? So he's a little crooked there. And that's the way the x-ray was taken. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. So he, he was very big and wiggly, but this was a, a good one to see, just some mild changes, um, as well as to appreciate some of the, the normal anatomy. Is a dog uh, anesthetized for this? No. Never? Or sometimes? Sometimes. It depends on how painful they are. Um, I think this guy had a little sedation um, to help with positioning, but you can see that this, things are symmetrical. So even though it looks like mm -hmm. that's kicked out, if you look at the symmetry of like right. the, these holes here, here, right there, right there, they're all relatively so this the is same. Real, this is just like mild. Yeah. Now will this get better? Could it get worse? It, w it will definitely get worse. Oh. It always progresses. It will never get better without um, surgical intervention, essentially. Do a lot of people choose surgical intervention for hip dysplasia for dogs? It depends on the dog and how bad it is. And how so old the it, dog is? Correct. Okay. So in this case, um, the dog, you know, every few months has an episode where he cries out, his hip hurts, he doesn't want to get up. Um, the dog gets some, some pain medicine, and the next day he's fine, right? Okay. There's virtually no arthritis in either of these hip joints. Uh, most of the time he's fine, he's running, playing, etc. So in this case, it's hard to argue for a several thousand dollar procedure. Sure. The extensive recovery time and kind of all the commitment that's involved with a, a surgery for that. And mm -hmm. we'll talk more about the different surgical options in a minute. Um, so this dog is currently um, being managed with some joint supplements like the glucosamine chondroitin. Uh, types of products um, and then uh, pain meds as needed for flare-ups basically. Okay. Um, so and no restrictions for the dog, just let the dog do what he wants. Right. Basically. Right. I okay. mean we don't want to um, limit quality of life if it's not you know making things Sure that's worse, always a big right? thing. Um, so uh, yeah he, he's still doing his, his normal thing um, and he is uh, happy and, and running around and, 
and doing things like that. Okay. So, you know, that's kind of the best case scenario is that the changes are, you know, more mild um, and they can be managed with, you know, some medicines or some supplements and um, that's kind of the extent of it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, now we have some dogs that have some more um, severe changes in their hips and I'm working on getting uh, an example of those Is it more out. common in bigger dogs than small dogs? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, and generally breed specific such as, I know German Shepherds are the ones we always talk about. Oh yeah, uh-huh. Um, Goldens, Bernese Mountain Dogs, um, Great Danes. But at what age with a larger dog would you be able to see this? Because in it, some cases the development is not to that point. I mean, you right. can't be bringing a dog, a German Shepherd puppy into three months. Would you see it at that young? It, it depends on, on the severity of it. Okay. So I've had some dogs that are very young, you know, uh, four to six months old. And uh, the, the owner's are like, you know, he just kind of walks funny. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so you, you feel some things, you take the x-rays and you find that it's there. I've had other dogs that have literally been fine, like the x-ray we just looked at. Mm -hmm. um, that dog for years and years was fine and then just had a couple of these episodes. And so we, we took the x-rays and see that. Um, even on his exam, he didn't really have any change in range of motion or, or anything like that. But there must just be enough laxity in that joint that it you know, snaps back in, or if he catches it just right, um, it causes that, that discomfort. While we're waiting for this to load, let me ask you another question. I'm a, I'm a, you know, we've talked about this, I'm a strong advocate about the issue that I have problems with people let their dogs get extremely overweight. Mm -hmm. is, is an extremely large dog and a heavy dog more prone to something like this than one that's more slim? And, they, and they're not more prone to it because it's a genetic issue, so right. they're born with it. But if they are overweight and do have hip dysplasia, it's going to make it worse and okay. progress faster. Okay, gotcha. And that's the same with any joint disease, mm -hmm. you know. Um, any extra weight that is on the body just puts more strain on, sure. on the joint. Sure, sure. So does this x-ray look familiar? Should it? Yeah. Is it... Uh is that Martin? No. Uh -huh. Is it? Yeah. Oh, all right. So this is your dog, Martin. And I wanted to show him because this is a good z example of some more severe changes um, going mm -hmm. on in, in some hips. Um, so uh, again, let's look at, at some of our parameters and let's focus on this side because his left hip is a little bit worse, right? Oh, yes. Um, Thanks for sharing that. <laughs> <laughs> so on the right I hip, haven't seen this either. Yes, you have. Have I? Did you yeah. show this to me? This is when he tore his cruciate. Oh, okay. All yeah. right. I did, I did see it. I, I forgot. <laughs> I tried to forget this. So, uh, again, things. over here we have our hip bone, uh -huh. the femur, with the ball on top, and then the acetabulum, our socket. So if we draw our imaginary line again from point to point, look how little uh, of that ball is, is in the socket. Oh, absolutely. Right? And then you can see it's flat on this side, and it is flat on, on this side. Okay, now with Martin, because he's older, there's some other changes that we've been talking about that have started to happen. Um, he has arthritis in the hips as well, right. which is what's going to happen in any unstable joint because there's mobility there. Sure. So for Martin, you know, he was kind of like the, the first dog. He has gotten around just fine, mm -hmm. et cetera. And then just like any older dog, you know, the arthritis starts to build up, but we just kind of have a direct correlation for the cause of that. So if I zoom in on the side we were just looking at, okay? Remember, there's our, our point to point, okay? And we've got about half of that head uncovered. Absolutely. Okay. Mm -hmm. So with him, we can see that he's starting to get some arthritis over here. So remember on the, the other film we looked at, how there was a dip down right here? Where is that? Show me where... Where my mouse is. Oh, I can see. Can, mm -hmm. can you see the mouse there? Okay. It's just my eyes that don't see the mouse. Gotcha. So there was a dip <laughs> down here, and we call mm -hmm. that going from the head to the neck of the femur, and mm -hmm. then it comes back out. That's filled in with some bone there. So there's a little arthritis. And we can see over here, so can you appreciate how that's not super smooth? It's kind oh, of fuzzy. Absolutely. Um, and that's a little extra bone that, that the body's laying down to try and stabilize things. Now, the left side is much worse. So this is all extra bone here and here. And that neck is completely filled in over there. We can even see that the, the socket 
has some changes to it as well. Um, it's brighter in some areas. It's got some extra bone over here. Uh, and so that's, you know, the body's trying to respond to, to the instability that's there to, to fill it in. Um, just to add something to this, um, I was telling you before we started the filming today that I remember when he was very young at maybe four or five months of age, I said to Dr. Stanton, he's walking funny. Mm -hmm. He said, you're crazy. I said, no, look at him from behind. There's something yeah. not right there. And it was bad then. Mm -hmm. And I said to him, what are we going to do? And he says, exercise him, get the muscles to take over. Uh, mm -hmm. We used that glycemine chondroitin mm -hmm. since he was a puppy. And I think the only thing that made him stable and be able to swim and do all those things that he became so muscular back there. Yeah. Now that's starting to go away now because he's getting older. Sure. But the muscle development that he had as a pup was so strong and I think it, it kind of diminished any effect he was going to have. Right, right. And you know, when they're younger, even if the, the hips are, are terribly formed, um, uh, unless they're, you know, popping in and out of the socket mm -hmm. or something, there's not a lot of inflammation there. Um, to cause a whole lot of, of discomfort versus, you know, an older dog or one that might be younger but still has, you know, these arthritic changes going on. Did anything I ever noticed from him as a puppy that he couldn't do, and even as he got older, he could never stand on his hind legs. Mm -hmm. That was really impossible for him or for a very short period of time. You know how yeah. people have their dogs dancing uh -huh. on the hand legs or standing yep. up at the counter? My collie's a counter surfer. Mm -hmm. He'd take anything off the counter. Martin would like to, but he can't because he could never support him himself yeah. for long periods of time. And that was another indication of something where he wasn't too right. Yeah, there. and that's probably just, you know, the way things are formed uh -huh. when he gets in that position, it puts pressure on yep. an area that, that's, that's uncomfortable or, or, or something like that. Okay. So, um, yeah, that's good. So what can we do about it is the next question. So if it's mild, we're going to try and manage it medically um, with the joint supplements, as needed pain medication, mm -hmm. exercise, physical therapy to develop those muscles and to keep things moving. We don't, uh, unless there's an acute flare up of, uh, of inflammation or discomfort happening, we don't really want to limit activity um, because we know that um, the longer an animal is inactive, the, the more cartilage starts to atrophy or kind of thin out. So you can actually cause more harm by the animal not doing anything. Um, so activity is a good thing. We want to keep them nice and lean, um, no extra treats, you know, we don't want them mm -hmm. to be overweight. And then we can manage flare-ups as they come, whether it's with pain medicine, um, some physical therapy types of things, um, the cold laser, the class four laser um, is very good for that as well. Would, would a dog ever have to be put down or anything if the hips are that bad? I mean, I if mean, it we're, was, we're looking at a lot of money here. Yeah, if it was to the point where um, the pain couldn't be managed, they couldn't get around, they couldn't go to the bathroom, things like that. Um, but otherwise, it's it's not a common reason for a dog to have to be put to sleep. Yeah, but boy, that's a lot. What's the cost for hip surgery? Well, we have, we have, I, oh, yeah, I, I, I don't know. Um, Range? Uh, dep it depends on the procedure, which we're going to talk about a couple. But I would mm. say like 1,000 to several thousand. I would think. Yeah. yeah. And again, it, does one need done? Do both need done? And a commitment on the part of the owner. Right. Because there's the rehab, and I, you know, you're looking at a lot of time here. Okay. Um, so if we can manage it medically, we're going to. Okay. Um, and that could be for the more mild case or the more severe case, which in which surgery is just not an option for one reason or another. Okay. Um, so the surgical options. Um, one procedure is called ephemeral head and neck osteectomy or FHO. Okay. Okay. So um, osteectomy means removal of bone and we're removing the, the femoral head and neck. So let's look at this dog. This dog didn't have hip dysplasia. It had another condition which affects the, the ball uh, of that joint, okay. the, the femoral head, but it results in the same procedure. Okay. So if, if the socket is okay, um, but you know, this ball is having a lot of the problems, this can be an option. So um, this side is relatively normal, okay? We've got our ball here, see how it tapers down to the mm -hmm. neck there, and then we've got the rest of it. Well, the, the right side, which is on our left, was diseased. Had over, this, here. over here. Over um, here. This uh, dog was only like, uh, 
just shy of a year old and already had a, a lot of arthritis um, oh. in, in this hip. And a bigger breed. And this was a small dog. Oh, this okay. was a small dog, yeah. okay. So um, what we did is we went in surgically and we basically cut off this chunk of bone here, the whole femoral head and neck from there. Mm -hmm. So if you look at this side, can you see how that is gone? There's no ball yes. and there's no little tapered area. So that sounds crazy, right? How is that going to make anything better? Now there's nothing in that joint at all. Um, what actually happens is when you get this out of there, that, that flattened uh, femoral head, um, the ligaments that are messed up in there, that's what's causing the instability, that's what's causing the arthritis and thus the pain. So if you get that out of there like we have over here, first of all your, your stimulus for pain is, is gone, mm -hmm. right? And then what happens is this space from where the neck started into the socket actually fills in with scar tissue, okay? So the, the space where this was fills in with scar tissue. Right. And all the muscles that make the hip move forward and backward are all still attached. They're attaching up here, over here, you know, in, in front where we can't appreciate on this. You know, this is a good view over here of where some are inserting uh, and some over here. So the leg can still function normally because all the muscles are still attached. You just don't have that, that socket in there uh, to keep it as stable. Um, but you, you've removed the problem area, the leg still moves normal, right. and they generally do pretty well. Um, so that's an option. It tends to be a little bit cheaper of an option because you're not putting any hardware or anything in the joint, right? Okay. Okay, so that's an option. Um, uh, sometimes better for small dogs um, because they don't have as much weight that's going in that, that scar tissue that's filling in. So the other option is a total hip replacement. And that's where you- On a dog. Mm -hmm, and that's where you really start talking where things get more costly. Mm -hmm. So when do you think about that? I tend to think of it for our large breed dogs that have severe changes in their hips, even when they're very young. Mm -hmm. um, because like we talked about with, with your dog and his knee, which we'll look at in a little bit, um, you have to kind of think, what are my expectations for this dog's lifestyle? If the dog lives to hike and to chase other dogs around the yard and, and to do things like that, that might be your best option to maintain quality of life for that dog. Right. If the dog is a couch potato and only gets up to go to the bathroom and is, you know, 10 years old, you still could do it, but it, it might not have as long lasting an impact as it would for a younger dog. And so, I would have chosen the latter because I would have said, you know what, he's 12 or 13. I'm not putting a dog that's 12 or 13 through that. Mm -hmm. that, was just, that was my personal opinion. Right, right. So what they do with that is they basically go in and they put an artificial hip joint. Like in. I have. Yep. All right. Yeah. So um, it, it sounds more straightforward, you know, like, oh, we're just putting a new hip. But it, it's much more involved sure. than just, you know, going in, getting through the muscles, dissecting, you know, that out, removing it, closing. Um, they have to attach, you know, hardware to the rest of the pelvis here and potentially the femur mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and make sure everything lines up very well. So it's a much more advanced uh, procedure. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that a specialty surgeon would do. And the rehab on that's pretty long too. Right, yeah. Yeah, just like a person, you know, um, or any orthopedic procedure, there, there's a, a period a of needing to uh, work back into things, strengthen sure. those muscles up, uh, maintaining pain, and, and those sorts of things. Okay. Any other questions about no, hip dysplasia? No, I can't think. I just know that uh, I was lucky because Martin had enough strength to be able to pull it off. Okay. Until his next injury. Yeah. 12 years later. So now let's talk about um, cranial cruciate ligament tears. Cranial. That's the head. Why, why are you saying cranial? Towards the head. Towards the head. Mm -hmm. What is it? Tell me a word that gets its name. Cranial? So cranial uh, means towards the head and caudal means towards the tail or the back end. Okay. So if we're looking at a knee, 
on a dog, in a human it's going to be anterior, posterior, right. right? So on a dog, if the dog is, is standing here, this is the cranial side because it's closest to the head and this is the caudal side because gotcha. it's closest oh, to the right. tail. Right. So we use those terms just like medial, um, lateral, lateral okay. dorsoventral, all that gotcha. stuff. So we can communicate. So if Dr. Wade takes an x-ray or does an exam and says, oh, there's pain on the cranial aspect of the stifle, and the dog comes back three days later for x-rays, I can say, okay, this is where it was sore, this is where she was describing, and oh look, there's a change on the x-ray that fits with what she felt and what I felt today, mm -hmm. and it's all lining up nicely, okay? Um, so let's talk about the knee. Are you going to bring my boy back up again? Uh, he's coming back uh, up. Oh, here he comes, or maybe not right away. So um, the knee is the next joint down, Mm -hmm. on the back leg uh, of a dog. So we, we had the hip first, and now we're getting to the knee. So I've got a little model here for us to look at so we can kind of see where some of these structures are um, that we are talking about. Now everybody thinks that the knee on a dog is where <laughs> it is at the very bottom six inches up from the foot. Right. That's not that's the knee. That's the hock or the ankle. The, but everybody thinks that's where the knee is. Yeah. The knee is actually in the in the rounded section. Right, right. Right, because I know that a lot of people thought it was the other way around. I said, no, no, it's, uh, they're looking for something that looks like the hock joint that they can see, but you really don't see a knee joint when you look at a dog. Well. Well, I didn't. I do, but you do, I, I look but, at it every day. <laughs> right, but I didn't, and I, you know, I said, well, where exactly is this injury? Okay, so here's our knee. So this is the, the femur, or the thigh bone. Remember, okay. we were just talking about that with our hip dysplasia. This is the joint in here, and then this is the shin bone, or the tibia. Okay. okay. Looking from the front, femur, joint in there, and then thigh bone. And then this or would go down to the hock and then me. into the foot. Yeah, the hock would be down here and, okay, the, and the foot gotcha. is down All here, right. okay? So um, this is, is stripped down a little bit, right? So the skin is gone, the muscle is gone, and we are left with the bones and the ligaments uh, of the knee, okay? And this is the fibula over here. Gotcha. It's that other little bone that runs on the outside of the, the lower leg. So this first ligament here, this is the patellar ligament, okay? So this is what the kneecap sits in. So if I flip this back, see the kneecap there? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's the kneecap underneath that, that ligament. So that sits on top of there. And this top part here is connected to the quadriceps muscles, okay, gotcha. mm -hmm. on top of the thigh here, so that when the quadriceps contract, it is going to make that motion, okay? Mm -hmm. So if, if I pulled on this ligament here, it's going to move that. So it's mm -hmm. like a kicking soccer ball type of motion, right? Gotcha. Okay. So I'm still with you, okay. believable, because we've talked about this. All thing. right. Okay. On the underside of that, again, we have our, our kneecap, and then can you see that groove there? Mm -hmm. So the kneecap runs in that groove, okay? So when this is flexing, that kneecap stays in that groove ideally, unless there's some other issue going on, okay? So we'll reflect that back. Uh, we've got the lateral collateral and the medial collateral ligaments, okay? Those are on the outside and help stabilize um, the knee in this plane, right? So we've got the patellar ligament keeping things central, and then we've got these collateral ligaments keeping things Left from shifting right. okay. back and forth, okay? Uh, in, inside here is what we're talking about, okay? So see how deep in the knee that we are already, okay? Let me grab a little probe here. So we're talking about the cruciate ligaments. Cruciate in uh, Latin means X, okay? So there are two cruciate ligaments. There's a cranial cruciate ligament and a caudal cruciate ligament, and they cross over and they make an X. So when somebody was dissecting a knee thousands of years ago, when people still spoke Latin, they said, oh, these cross over, we'll call them cruciate ligaments because gotcha. they make an X, right? right? Okay. So deep down inside is where all this trouble occurs. Right, and so you can see this gray tissue here those are our, mm -hmm. our cruciate ligaments. So one attaches up here and goes back there, and another attaches back here 
and goes forward. Oh, wow. Okay. Now, the cranial cruciate ligament is like the ACL in people. Okay. You always hear about sports stars tearing right. their ACL. Same thing. We just call it cranial cruciate ligament because dogs walk on all four, so it's cranial instead of anterior. Gotcha. Okay. So what it does, if I look from the side here, is it prevents the shin bone, the tibia, from shifting forward. So if I move these back and forth, see how stable it is? Mm -hmm. It won't go forward because that ligament is keeping this bone from shifting forward. Okay. It also has a role in some rotational forces as well. If we're looking on top, those mm -hmm. types of forces. Okay. So when that ligament tears, that then allows... Does it tear completely or just It partial? can tear partially or okay. completely. When it tears partially or completely, it allows the shin bone to shift forward, okay? So it's hard to emulate on this model because everything's so tight, but this bone would be shifted forward, okay? Hmm. So on an exam, when you're feeling the knee from the outside, you'll see us lay the dog on its side. Sometimes you can do them with it standing. And we will uh, isolate these points and hold the knee like this, okay? And then if it's torn, you can actually, see how the, the tibia comes back towards yeah. me? That's called a cranial drawer sign. I because thought, okay. it's moving cranially and it's like a drawer, like a, a mm -hmm. dresser drawer. And I can make it move back Indicating in, in, in that the, there's right. something wrong in it. Because if that ligament was there, this wouldn't be popped forward, and so I would have nothing to move back. Okay? There's another test where you take the foot, it's called the tibial thrust, and if I bend the foot, because everything is connected via tendons and ligaments, it will actually make the tibia, the shin bone, pop forward because that ligament's not there to hold it in place. So what's the the typical scenario uh, for this. Dog's out running around outside, all of a sudden it cries, it's lame. It Can't comes in, it's holding its leg up like this, hopping around, maybe it touches its toe down, right? Um, but, but that's all it is. You touch the knee, some dogs cry out, um, and it, it doesn't go away. You know, it's you're like, oh, maybe you just tweaked it, and, and two mm -hmm. days later, still holding the leg up, just toe touching. And, and that's it. But the key is that it happens all of a sudden, okay? It doesn't slowly fiber by fiber tear. Right. You know, it, it, it's all of a sudden. How do you find out how bad it is? With, uh, well... X-ray will show that. X-ray can give you some indication sometimes. If you really want to know, it's either at time of surgery or with arthroscopy. But usually there's enough, that's where you stick a camera in the joint. But they don't do an MRI or something like that on a dog, do they? Not, Not generally, because we know what's what torn. Is. And uh, if I look in the knee here again, you see that other gray disc there? Yeah. That's the meniscus that's often torn with it. And so those things are all addressed at the time of, of surgery. Okay. And it's pretty typical for, for them to, to need to be dealt with. So. Um, the dog comes in, lame all of a sudden. You bring him to the vet. Um, we, we do those maneuvers that I was just talking about, and it's like, mm, all right, looks like it's the cruciate ligament, but let's take an X-ray to confirm, mm -hmm. right? Um, so this is your boy again. Oh, there so this he was, is. Uh, last September. Yep, about the middle of September. Yeah. So let's focus on this side over here. Okay. This is a relatively normal looking uh, stifle joint. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so I can put our little model here and we can see how things look pretty similar. Okay. So we've got our, our femur or our thigh bone, the joint, and then the tibia, the shin bone. Yeah, right through here. Okay. Okay. So see this little triangle mm -hmm. here? Here's our little triangle here on the x-ray. We've got our kneecap right there, that little oval. And then do you see this fine white band coming down mm -hmm. over top of it? That's this patellar ligament. Now you can't see these other ligaments uh, you just in the plane that and we're looking. And this one's good? This one's good. Okay. So what, I, what we look at here is um, the joint spaces itself, okay? So we've got this patellar ligament running down the front side. We've got the tibial plateau here, and then the condyles of the femur. And that makes this triangle. And can you see how all of this is relatively black mm -hmm. in color? 
There's a little lighter gray area here. That's a little fat pad that sits in there normally, just for some, some cushion. But all of this is black, right? That's the way it's supposed to be. That's the way it's supposed to be. And then it's, it's very hard to uh, appreciate, but there's also a, a little faint line back here. And that is the, the back side of, of the joint, okay? Um, and, and that's not bulged out or anything like that. So. Um, this was okay. This side was okay. This side's okay. So let's look at the side that he was limping on, right? Oh, yes. So why don't you tell them why you brought him in, what, how you knew something was wrong? Uh, yeah, I got home from work, or not, enough, not home from work, before I went to work, mm -hmm. and he couldn't get up. He couldn't move. Right. And I called you whenever and, and I... he went outside and he was fine? Outside, everything was fine. The next time, he couldn't get up. I called him, couldn't mm -hmm. move, couldn't do a thing. Right. So I called you, and I, my conversation to you on the phone was, Donnie, I think Martin's had a stroke. Mm -hmm. There's something definitely wrong with his back. He can't do a thing with his back legs. He's right. just really a mess. Yeah. So I said, I'm going to give him a pain pill because mm -hmm. I have to go to work and I'll call you as soon as I get home. Mm -hmm. Got home two hours later, it was no different. Right. So we lifted him in the car, got him in the car, someone mm -hmm. helped me do that, and we brought him here, and one of the technicians carried him into the office we're in now, mm -hmm. and you started the examination of him. Right. And so, you know, when the owner says, you know, oh, maybe they had a stroke, you know, you check all the neurologic mm -hmm. reflexes. And if I would support him, he would stand on his own, but it was clear that one leg, you know, right. was worse. So you check those neurologic reflexes and everything seems intact. Then you start feeling all the musculoskeletal structures and he cries when you, or he, he you know, stops panting or does mm -hmm, something to indicate mm -hmm. that he's sore in his knee and then it kind of goes from there. And then, you know, we laid him on his side. We did those maneuvers that we talked about, had the, the cranial drawer, the tibial thrust, and we said, let's take an x-ray to, to see what we're dealing with here, okay? So this side compared to this side, can you see how kind of gray this is yes. in the joint space. There is no black like there is over here, right? It's all just kind of the same shade of gray. And then if we look at the back side, remember on the other side there's kind of a faint line there. Mm -hmm. This is kind of bulged out there. Again, with that same gray um, uh, opacity to it. So. Does this confirm, if you just showed me this knee, could I say that it's a, a cranial cruciate ligament tear? No. This tells me that there's a fusion and inflammation in the knee joint itself. When I couple that with my physical exam findings, then I can say I'm pretty sure that mm -hmm. the cranial cruciate ligament is, is torn, partially or completely, but that's what we're dealing with. And then we had the rest of our discussion. Right. So <laughs> once we, we have our x-rays, we have our exam, um, then we talk about what are our, our options are as far as we can do about it. And there's two big camps. There is medical management and there is surgical management. So. Um, and you're telling me the whole thing as yeah. you had to. Right. And I'm saying the whole time you're talking, <laughs> I'm not doing surgery. I'm not doing surgery. He's 12 and a half years old. I'm not doing surgery. Yeah. And your comment to me was, I'm giving you the options. Right. I have to give you all the options right. so you know. Right. So, um, so I sat there patiently and listened. Yeah. So let's talk about um, medical management. Uh, let's talk about surgery first, okay? okay? Um, kind of like the total hip replacement, I tend to think of surgery more for the dogs that don't respond to medical mm -hmm. management um, or are young or have a lifestyle like a hunting dog or something that demands peak physical performance, okay? So there are, are two main types of procedures. The gold standard is called a tibial plateau leveling osteotomy or TPLO. That's another specialty procedure that they do down in Pittsburgh right. for us. Okay? PBSCC, down on uh, Camp Point Road. And so what they do there is, it's the gold standard because if your goal is to get that dog back to as close to 100% as you're gonna get, and it's never gonna be 100% no matter what you do, but this is your best chance for getting that close. Um, all the data suggests that this procedure or similar procedures to it mm -hmm. um, give you the best chance for that. So what they do is um, they go in the joint, uh, they clean out any arthritis that might be there, um, and if the meniscus needs addressed, they address the meniscus, um, get out all the just inflammatory debris, okay? Then they take a, a circular saw, it, it's a little like a circular saw mm -hmm. that you, like you use for carpentry, and they make a cut in the tibia here, okay? And then once that 
the round piece of bone is there, they actually rotate it and pin it in place. Wow. Okay. So what? Why? Why do that? So remember before this stop set movement. This shin bone was mm -hmm. pushing forward. Mm -hmm. If you were to rotate it back, then it's going to pin it in place. Then it can't push forward. Go forward. So it, it brings the knee back into alignment and keeps it there mm -hmm. with hardware. So there's there's a little bracket that the, they put on and uh, that helps keep it in place. And an awful lot of dogs have this surgery. Yeah. Uh, and it's very, most of the ones I find are, are very successful. Right. Um, complications uh, can be things like uh, the body rejects the hardware, right. gets infected, and, and that's not specific to that procedure. Mm -hmm. um, but so, yeah, a uh, very good option. Another type of procedure um, is uh, called a lateral suture procedure. Um, in this procedure, uh, some uh, general practitioners will do. Dr. Becky Stanton does it here. Mm -hmm. um, but basically, instead of you know cutting any bone or anything like that, it basically loops uh, a thick nylon gauge suture around some of these sesamoid bones uh, in the front. It stabilizes. And it basically, the, the sutures are placed in this direction, yeah. just like the ligament, so it acts as a false ligament to keep things Does stable. that last forever? It can, yeah. It can, okay. Now there are um, reports of like some really big dogs, like really well muscled, like Rottweilers, pit bulls, things like that, that can snap the the nylon webbing. So um, we talk about that, you know, sometimes if it's a little twenty pound cocker spaniel or something, it's probably not going to tear the suture. Right. So that might be a, a a good option. But if it's a big dog usually we're like, like work. Nah, it yeah. probably needs the, the bigger procedure. So another- And these are expensive also. This is another very expensive right. operation. Right, mm -hmm. um, Both are, the lateral suture obviously is much cheaper than the TPLO right. um, because it doesn't require all the hardware and specialty surgical equipment and things like that, but still, you know, can be costly. One note about the surgical procedures is it's not an emergency procedure, okay? so. I'll have some people that are like, well, I don't know if I want to go to, to surgery. Like, you know, I'd consider it, but it's expensive. It's I a need lot, to think about it's, it. It's a lot of physical therapy. Mm -hmm. Like, do we need to know right now? The answer is no. Um, they're not emergency procedures. They don't have to be done right away. We can try medical management, keep the dog comfortable, um, decrease inflammation. And the worst thing that happens if they decide to do the surgery three months down the road is there's going to be more arthritis in that joint, in which case they just clean it all out when they do the surgery anyway. Right. Um, so does the surgery take 15 minutes longer? Yeah, but generally it's mm -hmm. not you know, a make or break it type of thing. So uh, that brings us to medical management. What is that? That was that, my choice. Yeah, that means that we're, we're using things that are not surgical to try and, and decrease inflammation and to give the body time to fill that joint in with scar tissue. Now, the problem with the medical management is there is always going to be that instability there. Mm -hmm. The body fills in, you know, that space with some scar tissue to some degree, but it, it's never going to be equivalent to the hardware or the nylon suture being there. Mm -hmm. So if a dog tore its cruciate it five years ago and comes in it's still going to have that same drawer it's going to have right. the tibial thrust but i can feel you know where some of the scar tissue has been laid down on the the in the inside aspect of the knee um, but it's still unstable so those dogs are much more prone to arthritis mm -hmm. than a dog that would have surgery but sometimes that's okay depending on the lifestyle of the dog just like we talked about with the hip so i've had a, a string of like little like old Yorkies, old Chihuahuas, <laughs> old Maltese's that have had uh, cruciate ligament tears. Mm -hmm. And we talk about all the options and the owners aren't sure what to do. And I say, well, wh what are, let's think about our goals long term, okay? Does Fluffy live to go outside and play fetch for you know 30 minutes at a time? Do you take her hiking with you every weekend? You know, is she hunting rabbits? Whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and they're like, oh no, she, you know, lays on her bed. <laughs> oh, um, if I walk to the kitchen, she'll walk out with me. She gets a little biscuit and then she walks back in and lays on her bed. Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, well, that's that's helpful information because we can say, look, 
yeah, you could spend you know three thousand dollars on a surgery, but if if she's not gaining anything from that surgery, mm -hmm. if she doesn't need that increased physical activity, um, and she's not in pain, then maybe that's not the best mm -hmm. option for, for everybody. Right. So I, I try to look at it in terms of that. Like, what are our goals with pursuing uh, a surgery? Mm -hmm. um, do we need to do it? Um, and so medical management um, initially for the first like two weeks were restricting activity, no running, jumping, playing, because we don't want this to start healing, especially if it's a partial tear and the dog's feeling better. So somebody lets the dog out to go to the bathroom, it sees a squirrel, takes off sprinting, tears it the rest of the way or re, you know, flares up the injury, whatever. So activity restriction. We started them on joint supplements, um, glucosamine chondroitin, something similar, um, because we know that joint's unstable and an unstable joint is predisposed to arthritis. So we wanna cut that off as, as soon as we can. Um, and then some of the um, joint supplements like the one that we have have just some like natural anti-inflammatory properties right. or molecules in them as well. So that's a kind of a more natural anti-inflammatory that you're not giving like a drug for. Mm -hmm. And then we usually do put them on some pain medicine. Mm -hmm. Ideally a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. Um, we do recommend blood work beforehand, especially if it's an older dog, because if the kidneys are, are unhappy or something, we don't want to give those no, medicines, we're not right? Do that. Um, but that's one, and then if they're really uncomfortable, we can add another pain medication on, on top of that to get better control. But the, the goal is that those are temporary. We get the acute inflammation down and they come off the, the pain medicine at, at some point. And finally, um, we often recommend the laser therapy uh, to help with the inflammation. Because you can see all this inflammation in here, right? Oh, all, was... all of that, you know, that, that fuzziness that's in there. And so the, the laser can be helpful to quiet that down more quickly. And again, it's a non-pharmaceutical thing that, that we can do to help with that. My, uh, my choices were, um, we did the pain medication. We put mm -hmm. them on three pain medications immediately. Mm -hmm. And then we got him back in the car and got him out of the car. I had, uh, my problem, he had to have three steps. I was lucky, only three steps getting into the house. So we mm -hmm. got him in. I used a ramp, and this happened in September. We had the ramp in place in probably two days. Mm -hmm. And then we had another step made so we could get into the house easier. And then I think I did, I'm not kidding you, I bet I did 15 laser at least. Yeah. And I did them constantly. Mm -hmm. And did I restrict his movement and everything because it was really an issue he went out on a leash mm -hmm. and he came in on a leash and yeah. that was it and, and it's been it's funny we're talking about this because I, you and i just discussed it it's been eight months mm -hmm. and today was the very very first time i ever saw him running a little bit yeah i mean he always just went along and did his own thing and very slowly mm -hmm. and today i called him and he ran a little bit and it's been eight months but it's been in many ways eight months of tremendous amount of attention on my part right and, and watching and, everything and that's the big thing hard. is that because there there's no hardware in there to to really support things mm -hmm. where they're unstable it's very easy to flare up or uh, further the injury if you're not careful right. now again we want them to get with any approach we want them to get back to doing their normal thing right and fortunately for martin you know he doesn't need to go hike 20 miles or no, but whatever. No, it's all the way down the end of the property. And it's like, <laughs> oh, come on. Now, the other thing that I also do is I'm doing maintenance laser. Mm -hmm. So once a month, I come in and we do a laser again. And sometimes I pump a little bit more pain medication into him right after that. Mm -hmm. He seems to be a little bit stiff. Yeah. Uh, he can't get up on a floor such as this. Mm -hmm. So when the other dogs are in jail in the kitchen, He's in the living room, so he, he'll never be able to get up well. So he's got traction. He, he gets traction outside very well. Right. But things and like that. So I made a lot of adjustments, but was it worth it? Absolutely. Yeah. But it and was then, a long time. And then, you know, time. the other thing with him is he's got the hip dysplasia and the arthritis there, sure. too. So of like the four big joints in his legs, three of them are, are not so hot. No, You know what not, I mean? So you, you've had to do a lot of now. special detail. Yeah. Um, another point to mention is that uh, many dogs that tear one cruciate ligament will often tear the mm -hmm. other. Um, so to kind of be thinking about that. Mm -hmm. um, some have two torn and you know, it's just they've been running around still anyway. and. I, I don't think he'll ever go be able to go up steps. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine it. Even though there's only three to get into my house, I, he wants to do it, and I don't even let him. Yeah. I just say, no, no, you're going in and out on the ramp. Mm -hmm. Now, he can go down steps, and that's no problem at all. 
but he up steps. We've just always avoided that. So it's been what nine months since he's gone yeah. up a pair of steps. But you have to make a lot of adjustments, and it's worth it if you want that dog to have the type of life you want him to have, mm -hmm. and he's happy as can be. Yeah, barking at everything and the whole bit. Um, then you make those adjustments. Mm -hmm. And I was lucky because at 12, and we've talked about this so many times, 12, 12 and a half, he's a bigger dog. I wasn't even going to consider surgery. Right. In fact, I thought we were going to put him down the day I brought mm -hmm. him in. I mm -hmm. said, if he's had a stroke, we're putting him down right away. That was our conversation yeah. on the phone. Uh -huh. And then the good news was there was something wrong, but we could maybe fix it. Yeah, or yeah there, there's something it. we could try to do about it. Right, so it worked out well. Well, I'm glad we got to discuss this. I was shocked that you, I didn't know you were going to have Martin's pictures. That was cool. I, I thought they'd be good ones to look at. Well, I hadn't really seen them because I was so upset the day it happened. <laughs> and you're being so patient with me and you're explaining everything to me. And I'm probably not even hearing it. And I know you showed these to me, uh -huh. but I never saw them. Yeah. I mean, oh, okay, well, fine. Well, now what are we going to do? Yeah. Because <laughs> I wanted the immediate fix. And the immediate fix, as I said, it's been eight months and it's, it's been tough. Mm -hmm. But he's getting along just fine. And right. He's comfortable. He He's is. Not sore. He still walks around the property. Yeah. In fact, the other day he took a walk way down towards the pond. I said, "Where's Martin?" And someone said, "We haven't seen him for a while." I said, "Where is it?" And he was way down on the back of the property, <laughs> and just doing his own thing, walking along very slowly. And yeah. that's what he wants to do. So he's happy. Well, um, I can't think of any other questions. Um, I guess it's an individual thing. It's an individual thing, and a, a, an owner has to decide what mm -hmm. they want to do. Yep. And can you have somebody that's going to watch that dog, or are you going to watch that dog? Are you going to? Mm -hmm. see, I mean, we get pills, we get pain pills every morning. We get them every night. We do them exactly the same. We don't miss a pain pill. Mm -hmm. We don't miss a laser treatment, and it's just a, a lot of responsibility onto a, an owner. But to me, it was better than the surgery. Mm -hmm. Although at the bark park, I see an awful lot of dogs that have had the surgery, and they're all doing very well. Yeah. Yep. But yeah, again, like you said, it, it's, it's a personal decision. It, it depends on the owner, it depends on the dog, mm -hmm. and it depends on our expectations for what life is going to be like after whichever avenue we well, choose. They do an awful lot of the orthopedic um, uh, specialty surgeries done at uh, PVSCC yeah. down there on Camp Point Road. I know a lot of, not only here, but I know a lot of the veterinarian services do send them down there. Mm -hmm. They're mm -hmm. good. Yeah, they're very good. That's where you want to go if you've got a real crisis situation. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks. You're I appreciate welcome. it. And uh, if anybody that's uh, watching this episode or has any ideas as to what they'd like to see us do next, let me know, let the Connie Lake Vet know, or let Connie Lake Bark Park know, and we'll try and pull something else together for them. Sounds Thank good. you. You're Thank welcome. You.